This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Well, hey there, come on in, chillax, enjoy the show. I am Ray, he of course is Kenny B, and here is your lineup for today. Mr. Bergamy. It is a good one, Ray. Straight ahead, the dreaded cotton leaf roll dwarf virus. It's destroyed crops worldwide and has now made its way here to Georgia. We'll hear from researchers as well as the Georgia Cotton Commission on what's being done to combat the problem. Also on the show, these aren't your ordinary sheep. They've been tasked with making sure the lights remain on and the grass stays low. You'll also hear about their ties to the Newton County FFA chapter. Plus, well, hey everybody, Ranger Nick. You know, I've been known to play in the dirt and what you're looking at right here is some very special soil. Down here in Calhoun County, I'm gonna introduce you to some folks that are using this to grow some very special and unique plants that are benefiting the community. That and so much more starts right now on the Farm Monitor. Well, first off, let's start with the policymakers. Georgia, of course, one of the most agriculturally diverse states in the country. So it should come as no surprise that 20 different sectors of the industry were represented at this year's GFB Commodity Conference. It was a chance to discuss some of the major issues affecting farmers today, as well as recognizing good work done in the field. Damon Jones has your recap. Leaders from all different aspects of Georgia Ag gathered in Tifton for the annual GFB State Commodity Conference, where information was shared, policies were discussed, and potential problems were addressed. And none are bigger than the economic outlook for the upcoming year, especially with the escalating trade war with China that recently took yet another turn. Uh, China announced they're gonna stop purchasing all agricultural goods altogether. Well, we weren't shipping a lot of ag goods this past year because they had huge tariffs on our major exports to China. I think one that, it, that it's going to impact is pork because pork, even with a 63% tariff, had been shipping pork to China because of the challenges they're facing with securing a pork supply or even animal protein supply due to African swine fever. This recent news not only will affect an already struggling ag industry in the short term, but also signals to farmers that they might want to prepare for a lengthy dispute. I wish I could say that there's an end in sight, but given the escalation over this past week, this past weekend, as well as the uh, rhetoric coming out from both sides of this trade uh, situation, I do not see it getting much better anytime soon. I think this is going to be a long-term challenge for American agriculture, and farmers are going to have to deal with the level of uncertainty that we're facing, as well as uh, the volatility in, in the markets. Unfortunately, with all that unpredictability, the best thing farmers can do to wait out the storm is tightening the belt a little bit more. I think with all the uncertainty and again volatility facing everybody, is I think risk management is going to be key. Uh, anything you can do to cut down as much cost as you can, and I, I know farmers have been doing that for a while and there's not much more they can do, but I think that's going to be key moving forward. While it won't be a long-term solution, the newly implemented aid package will provide some much-needed relief as farmers continue to wait for a resolution between the two countries. Uh, farmers really just want to compete. Uh, U.S. farmers have a comparative advantage over the, most of the rest of the world. Uh, they can produce food and fiber more efficiently, more economically, and more effectively than most elsewhere in the world. And when faced with a level playing field, uh, U.S. farmers have the confidence that they're going to be able, be able to succeed. Speaking of success, every year the Georgia Farm Bureau hands out their Commodity Award, the organization's highest honor. And this year's recipient was longtime livestock advocate Patsy Cannon, who's dedicated more than 35 years to the industry. And while she's done everything from call livestock shows to setting up sales, she says the thing she'll remember the most is... The people and the relationships that you have. Um, you know, people are the same wherever you go, just wonderful, wonderful people. and. Um, and that's, to me, that's what it's all about, the people and the relationships, the things that you can share uh, with one another. You know, the, the people involved, of course, that's the big thing, the people that are involved, because um, no two people may not necessarily have the same breed, but you've got the same type of people, which, again, it's, it's like a, a family, and you try to work with them, whether it's this breed or that breed or a composite breed or commercial cattle. Reporting from Tifton. I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. Meantime, it's no secret that cotton is crucial here in Georgia, generating almost $1 billion to the state's economy. 
But all that could change in an instant due to a virus that has previously devastated crops in Brazil and Africa. It's called cotton leaf roll dwarf virus, and it's currently being studied by the UGA cotton team. John Holcomb explains. Last year around this time, something was off in some cotton fields in Georgia. After doing some testing, they found out that something was off indeed. They discovered a virus that is new to the U.S. called cotton leaf roll dwarf virus, a virus that has caused major damage in Brazil and Africa and can't be stopped once it sets in. The scary thing about this virus is that we don't have any solutions for it. Um, it's a virus that that affects the plant, basically shuts down its vascular system and the plant doesn't set fruit um, and has a hard time making yield and ultimately doesn't contribute to yield at all if it does get the virus based on what we've seen in um, the literature from other countries. Since last year's discovery, the UGA cotton team has been doing research funded by the Georgia Cotton Commission and Cotton Incorporated to learn more about this disease. The research that these researchers do uh, it, as it relates to cotton blue disease or, or various other projects that they do uh, is important because cotton is our number one row crop here in Georgia. We've got cotton in 95 counties across the state. It's you know, a, nearly a billion dollar economic impact and we, you know, if, if we have a, a crop loss like they did in, in some parts of Alabama or what we've heard and seen from Brazil, that would be devastating. So far this year, they have already seen it in fields and suspect it can be found statewide. They're still learning about it, but what they do know is that it's being carried by aphids, which are insects that feed on plants. This virus cannot travel from one plant to another by itself. They need a vehicle. Right. So the vehicle here is the insect, and the insect particular here is cotton aphid that is more efficient here. So when the cotton aphid take the virus from one plant to other plant, it inject it in the phloem of the plant. And once the plant has been infected, it immediately starts to take effect and will start showing symptoms. As shown in these pictures, the virus causes redness in the leaves and will even cause them to start drooping. In some cases, the virus can even cause dwarfness in the plant. The stack, once they are growing, so stacks are like smaller. So what we call as a stacking internode, making the plant dwarf or a little bit like bunchy on the top. Like I said earlier, there is still a lot to learn, and at the end of the season, they're hoping to have more answers and maybe solutions as they watch what happens to the infected plants in their research plots. This year, as we progress, we will try to find what is the exact symptoms. We are following different plants that we have detected till now in our research plots, and we will be following and we will be able to fine-tune the symptoms related to this virus by the end of this year. Reporting in Tifton for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. Well, hey everybody, Ranger Nick, this beautiful sunflower is brightening the lives of all kinds of residents down here in Calhoun County, Georgia, and I'm going to explain how Extension has been involved in making this possible. That's on the other side of the break. I'm Maddie Ann Davis. I'm Vice President of Georgia FFA Association. I grew up all around agriculture. I live on a 100 acre family farm. I've shown livestock since I was three. I began showing pigs at that age. So I grew up around agriculture my whole life. The one thing that FFA has done for me is it's opened the door to so many opportunities. I've got to travel to Washington, D.C. I've got to go pick out my livestock projects in Illinois. It's opened those doors and built so many relationships that I wouldn't have got in just the classroom setting. To learn more about the National FFA organization, log on to ffa.org. All right, time for your monthly dose of Ranger Nick. This month, he checks in from Calhoun County. When community leaders there learned of a health concern, they decided to do something about it. With the help of UGA Extension, they launched a campaign entitled Healthier Together Calhoun. Here's Nick with more. 
Well, those of you that have watched the Ranger Nick segment over the years probably can imagine that I'm a people person. I like to be around other folks, whether that's a barbecue or maybe in a classroom at the University of Georgia. Being around folks is something I love, but I would never thought that going to a garden would be a place where I could meet up with other individuals and some of those benefits. And I'm going to tell you about a lady that knows a thing or two about gardening and the benefits of a garden like this that can provide for the community. And that's Christina Gardner. Christina, so good to meet you and be with you today. Yes, sir. Good to see you. Hey, you got what we were looking at going out here down in southwest Georgia, being able to see the benefits of this. Aside from the food aspect of this, obviously getting some of these yummy veggies mm -hmm. into the community's hands, what's something that came from this that you think is a benefit beyond just food? Something you have seen in the community that this garden has benefited? Well, the most incredible part of the garden that I have seen, um, aside from the food being brought to the community, is the fact that it brought the community together. Um, we have so many different aspects that are working together, um, all towards that one common goal of increasing the food capacity here. But the schools are working together, so the charter school and the high school. We've got the county commissioner involved. We've got the community center involved, the city of Leary. So everybody is coming together to work towards this common goal. And what's so cool is this is the catalyst for this. This is the bridger to involve right. some of these stakeholders and extensions got that going on you know I'm a big fan I always push it and you mentioned stakeholder groups and I have to my left a very influential stakeholder in the community Miss Brenda so good to be with you today good to be with you well, I appreciate you being out here on this hot day in South Georgia so as a county commissioner what is something that you think is so special about this garden which is by the way right behind the Calhoun County Extension Office right here in Georgia What's so special about this place, so influential about this for you as a community leader? Well, I wanted to give back to the neighborhood. I wanted to give to the older people who can't get out and get fresh vegetables. So this is my way. I raise my garden, and when they get ready, I gather them, I bring them to town, share them with the people, and then those that are shut in, I take them door to door. You bring those veggies, you bring this stuff to them as a leader in the community. Yes. I mean, that small town benefits beautiful to be able to see that. And you said your garden. You have your own? Yes, I do. So you at, at your house or at your office? I have two at my house, and I have one at the office out there that I take and I share because that's what it's all about. Sharing. Well, and this has started here. Now, from a benefit from the community side, Christina mentioned the idea of youth, and Luke is joining us over here. Luke, good to be with you today. Glad to be here. Thanks for coming. From the youth side. I love working with kids. What's a benefit for kids out here in the garden that you've seen? We've talked about the, the older adults. What about the youth? Yeah, uh, you know, we always go into the school and talk about agriculture and gardening and the benefits, but this, this garden actually gave us an opportunity to provide an outdoor classroom. So the students, we come out and they help us plant, help us harvest. We've talked about fertility and, you know, just about agriculture in general and benefits. And just imagine, they're not doing it on a phone. They're doing it for real. I want to talk next about how this all got going. And if you're watching at home wondering, how can I get this started? You're about to learn right now. So the people side of this, so obvious. I'm talking with our friends before, but Christina, you were a catalyst for getting these six raised beds going. And from what I understand, this is something through the gracious support of Extension and, and grant work, I understand, that got going. Is that right? Yeah, so this started um, in the very beginning through a grant from the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention. Um, Calhoun County, I was unfortunately selected for their high obesity rates. Okay. Um, so as a way to kind of combat that, we put together a coalition team um, and that coalition came up with some things that they thought could identify and help with those high obesity rates. Um, yeah, and so a garden was one of those things that they thought could bring more fresh produce into the community. And they thought that, not thinking that maybe a farmer's market would do it, but why not a farmer's market? I mean, that's another way to get people out. Why a garden? Right, so a farmer's market, from an extension perspective, that was something that was seemed like a great idea. Okay. But when the coalition came together and those stakeholders started talking, um, they wanted the produce to come from here. Uh, they didn't want it to come from an outside source into the community. They wanted it to come from the breads that they raise. And, oh. uh, uh, their gardens. So it was interesting that, you know, that's what Extension was kind of leaning towards and going towards, but uh, we definitely wanted to make sure that it was community-based and those stakeholders were really buying into what 
um, would help the community. And, and that's something that a lot of people at home may not realize. Extension is so needs-based. You're going and you're listening to folks, figuring out this is what they would like and appreciate, and you're making it happen. I'm looking around and I'm thinking this has been here for a decade. Has it or, or no, what? No. Um, actually, we started the grant process in 2015, okay. but this garden was not established until 2017. So this two is years. only about two years worth of, wow. of gardens, and this is only one of six sites. So this started as our um, as our teaching garden. We kind of. Uh, implemented it to do a trial and error. We would try things here, especially like uh, the drip irrigation system and stuff. Uh, we tried that in our garden first before we asked community members to try it there. Because you want to squash out uh, anything that's going to go wrong. I knew that's yes, what you were thinking. Yes, right? Exactly, exactly. We want to make sure it's top notch. All right, right. So what I want to talk about last of the folks at home is some pieces of advice that you and others might have if you want to get something like this going in your neck of the woods. So Christina, we're going to go there next. Well, look at the size of those sunflowers. Look at the size of the tomato plants. I was under the impression that that kind of growth was 10 years in the making. And instead I learned from Christina, it was only two. What you're looking at right there in front of you is perhaps the reason for such great growth, great yield. Luke, tell us about this special soil mixture that you've got. Nick, we like to call this magic soil. It's equal parts topsoil, cow compost, and mushroom compost. And uh, this soil has, it has allowed us to yield over 100 pounds per squash plant. Holy, and, and not just yield 100 pounds for a squash plant is incredible. What about varieties? You growing anything special out there? Yeah, the soil has actually gave us the opportunity to grow other varieties and, and experiment with other varieties. One of those is the watermelon radish we cut oh. into earlier. Yeah. Yeah. It's been real cool and, and we've been real successful with that too. So this is neat. So this is this idea of this trial garden right here at the Calhoun County Extension Office. Now, Christina, come back over to you here. Folks at home that are wondering about doing this in their county at their local extension office, what pieces of advice beyond the special magic soil that Luke talked about, what piece of advice would you offer to the folks at home to get this going on where they are? Yeah, absolutely. The soil is definitely something that's important, but just as equally as important is where we place those beds and the design of the beds. We, in our trial garden here, we built our beds just a little bit too big. So now trying to work in them is a little bit difficult. So now from learning from that mistake, we're able to advise people to make them a little smaller, a little more manageable. So when we started this, we weren't afraid to make those mistakes. We, uh, that's what we were here for. So Extension is here to provide that advice um, and give you some recommendations as far as like what Luke was talking about with different uh, varieties that you can grow. Um, things that kind of complement each other in the garden as well as your pollinators. Yeah, and, and not you're just not doing this yourself. Others are doing this too, volunteers. Yes, yeah, so we have volunteers all throughout the community. We're here for that advice, but then the volunteers actually do the work um, and they take ownership of their individual gardens. It's incredible. We're always tooting the extension horn and I can't thank you enough for joining us. Thank you, so thank, you thank you, thank you. And Luke, thank you so thank much you for being with us. Absolutely. Y'all know what to do at home. When you're online looking up your local extension office and the potential you could have to grow a garden there, hop over to the Georgia Farm Monitor Facebook page and check out what Ray and Kenny and the others have got going on. Hop over to the Ranger Nick Facebook page and see what I've got going on. And until next time, for the Farm Monitor, as we always say, I'm Ranger Nick reminding you that enthusiasm is contagious. So pass it on. Y'all, thanks so much for joining us this month, and we'll look forward to seeing you when we get back together again next time. See ya. Nick, thanks so much, my friend. Up next, we head to a solar farm to see how sheep and a local FFA chapter are making good use of a very bright and efficient idea. Well, welcome back. Time for some trivia. And what do you get when you combine about 50 sheep with solar energy? All right, well, what you get is a very efficient partnership. Last year, Newton College and Career Academy FFA teamed up with Snapping Shoals EMC to create a sustainable approach to their solar farm, Weed Control. Pretty neat stuff. Check it out. One of the main things about solar is one of the most valuable resources is the property. It's not the panels that are sitting on it, you have to buy the property. And so you have to maintain that. And instead of just leaving it laying here unused, we decided we would bring sheep out to maintain the facility. And if you'll look under this panel, they're doing exactly what they need to do. Uh, during the heat of the day, you have a shadow and that's where they graze. During the heat of the day, 
and it's almost a defined line, plus they sleep under there. And the problem we have, if you don't maintain that, you have weeds, woody weeds, that can grow up in between these panels and do damage to the wires, the vines that will wrap around, and they'll shade the panels. So they're doing exactly what they need to do. Uh, some of the shoot belong to the school, some of them belong to Snapping Shoals EMC. Um, but that, that eliminates some of the herbicide application we have to put out here under the panels to keep the weeds down that make the pa panels productive. Um, also gives the students at the school an opportunity to come over here, work the sheep, and give them a place to house some of their sheep. Well, I grew up on a small farm not far from here, and so that is what I've always loved. And I was in the Newton County FFA, and I feel like I'm helping give back, and Snappy Shoals is giving back to our roots, really. Most of the sheep that we have here are Katahdin sheep, which are what are considered a hair type sheep. And the good thing about them, you don't have to shear them. Uh, and they're resistant to a lot of the internal parasites and a lot of the foot problems that you typically have in the humid, hot southeastern climate. Now this particular sheep here, she is a retired club lamb. One of the FFAers would show her uh, so when they get through with their shows, they can come out here and eat grass and live a long and happy life. But uh, most of our sheep are Katahdin and they're a good breed for uh, this type of uh, facility uh, and in this climate. Finally this week, livestock producers. I'm sure you'll agree good fencing is essential to your farming operation. That's why every year the University of Kentucky offers a one-day school where participants get their hands dirty and put what they've learned into action. Jeff Franklin reports. Close to 50 people took part in this one-day fencing school held at Russellville in Logan County. The morning was classroom instruction and then the group moved outdoors in the afternoon to a farm to see the fencing principles they learned put into practice. Industry experts demonstrated some of the latest equipment for driving fence posts in the ground. How to properly brace fencing with high tensile wire and using the right insulation to protect and preserve electric fences for long life. The information covered is what brought Butch King to the fencing school, who has had a variety of livestock, from hogs, cattle, and goats. I like going here and talking to other people, uh, and you always learn. I always try to target on four or five things that I can go back and kind of evaluate. Am I doing it this way? Can I do it a better way? And you'll see real quick it's tough. The latter part of the day was designed for participants to get some hands-on experience using the techniques demonstrated by the experts. University of Kentucky Extension Forage Specialist Chris Toich, who organized the fencing school, said it's important to learn good fencing techniques to last the test of time. If you've ever driven around the countryside, there's a lot of fence, but, but not well-constructed fence. And one of the goals of this school was to help people get the basics of fencing down so that they can build a strong, durable fence that's going to last 25 or 30 years. Fencing's always been one of those things that uh, it's a pastime, you, it's hard work. Uh, it's something, as a kid, I never looked forward to doing fencing. So having, uh, being able to see the new ways to do it, new technologies to make it easier, to make it safer, uh, and overall boost our quality of fencing is always a great thing. Now, if you own livestock, you know that you gotta have fencing. It's a necessary evil. Something that you may not necessarily enjoy doing, but something that is a must have. A month and a half ago, my wife was ready to sell the farm and all the cows. Uh, I was away for a week or 10 days uh, with some work related stuff and the cows got out four or five times. She said, I'm through with it, I'm done with it. You gotta do something about these fences. Butch King says he plans to take what he learned at the fencing school and put it to use on his farm, hopefully saving his marriage in the process. From the University of Kentucky College of Agriculture, Food and Environment, I'm Jeff Franklin reporting. Jeff, thank you so much, sir, and thank you for watching. We are out of time. Take care, everybody. We'll see you back right here next week on the Farm Monitor. Have a good week. Stay safe.